just gonna skim past those. Uh, we're gonna start with annual report. For the annual report, uh, it's most important. Uh, it's the most important report that firms it's issue to their stockholders and the public. Um, overall performance of a firm of a firm for the most recent fiscal year is like tables containing financial information, operations, information on the firm's products, services, and contributions. Uh, audited financial statements, balance sheet, income statement, uh, statement of retained earnings, and the statement of cash flows. Um, the five most important accounting principles would be like assumption of arm's length transaction, uh, cost principle, realization principle, uh, matching principle, and going concern assumption. Um, to review over like uh, kind of like what the balance sheet is, uh, you have like your firm assets, uh, which is like the left side of the balance sheet, which we show like your assets, uh, a firm's owns, uses gener or uses to generate uh, revenue, and then the assets are listed in order of liquidity. Um, and then sources of funds on the right side of the balance sheet show uh, like uh, the use to acquire assets, uh, liabilities are listed in the order in which they are due to be paid, uh, stockholders' equity is listed last, and common stockholders are entitled to assets um, remaining after all other providers of funds are paid. And this is like an example of what it would look like with the assets on the left and liabilities on the right and like listing them in order. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, and these are just like definitions kind of of like explaining what they are, like current assets, assets are like, that are likely to be converted to cash within a year, um, like marketable securities, accounts receivable, and inventory, um, like current liabilities, so liabilities scheduled to be paid within a year, um, like accounts payable, procured, or uh, accrued wages, uh, debt with less than years maturity, and taxes. And then for the network and capital, this is the for the long-term assets, um, so we have the real assets, which consists of land, buildings, and equipment, and then there are also intangible assets, such as goodwill, patents, and copyrights. And then for long-term liabilities also, so long-term debt, we have bank loans, mortgages, bonds with maturity longer than one year. And then for equity, it consists of uh, common stock, which is the ownership with control of the firm as well as basic rights of ownership, which is the right to vote on corporate matters, the preemptive right to purchase additional shares proportionally when new shares are issued by the company, and the right to receive cash dividends if they are paid. The right to corporate assets if the firm is liquidated after all creditors and preferred stockholders. And then more of the equity will be with retained earnings, which is profit cuts and used to acquire assets. I can't and then it. there is treasury stock, I just have to where the shares of some stock a firm holds rather than sell them to the public. And there is also preferred stock, which is the ownership without controlling the firm and features it in an equity security that resembles debt. And then the income statement. For an overview, it measures the profitability of the firm for a reporting period. And revenue is income from selling products and services. And then expenses include costs of providing products and services and asset utilization. And the equation for will be net revenues minus expenses. And then this would be an income statement kind of balance sheet for the fiscal year, for example. So uh, now I'll get into depreciation expense. So depreciation expense uh, includes the cost of a physical asset, like a plant or uh, machinery that's written off over its lifetime. This is called depreciation. It's a non-cash expense. Uh, firms use one of these depreciation uh, methods. There's straight line depreciation and there's accelerated depreciation. Um, firms will choose a method for internal purposes and one for uh, tax purposes or for statements released to the public. And then this is, uh, then we get into amortization expense. So amortization expense is related to using intangible assets such as goodwill, patents, licenses, and uh, life depreciation. Amortization is a non-cash expense. 
Uh, then we get into our statement of cash flows. So uh, first concept is that net cash flow is equal to cash flows, cash inflows minus cash outflows. So all the cash that we take in, uh, basically minus all the all the cash that we spend. Uh, the statement of cash flows shows the company's cash inflows and outflows for a period of time. So it's over a specific time period. Um, for like example of this, like it'll include things like working capital, fixed assets, long-term liabilities and equity and dividends. So the or the way that the uh, cash flow statements are organized is that you have your uh, operating activities. So you have your cash inflows from selling goods and services, and then your outflows from raw materials, uh, inventory, salaries, wages, utilities, rent. So like those are things that you have to spend money on. And then selling the goods is the inflow. That's the stuff that you're generating cash from. Then after that, you have your uh, in your cash flows from investing activities. So um, like inflows and outflows uh, from that will include things like uh, buying and selling long-term assets like plants and equipment, and then um, buying and selling bonds and stocks issued by the firms. And then you have your cash flows from financing activities. So inflows uh, from issuing debt and equity and borrowing money, and then outflows from paying interest and paying dividends, repaying uh, loans, purchasing uh, tre uh, treasury stock. And that's an example right here of a cash flow statement. And then that's the copyright for the book. So that's our presentation. Thank you.
We're doing chapter four, which is analyzing financial statements. So for the learning objectives, um, we're going to explain the three perspectives from which financial statements can be viewed, uh, describe common size financial statements, explain why they are used and be able to prepare them, and use them to analyze the historical performance of a firm. discuss how financial ratios facilitate financial analysis and be able to compute and use them to analyze a firm's performance. Also, we'll be able to describe the DuPont system of analysis and how and be able to use it to evaluate a firm's performance and identify corrective actions that may be necessary. Uh, we're also going to explain the benchmark, what the benchmarks are, describe how they're prepared, and discuss why they're important for financial statement analysis and identify the major limitations of using financial statements. Categories of common financial ratios is liquidity ratio, efficiency ratio, leverage ratio, profitability ratio, and market value ratio. The first one is short term liquidity ratios, and liquidity ratios indicate a firm's ability to pay short term obligations with short term assets without in, um, endangering the firm. So, in general, higher, higher ratios are favorable, favorable if they favor. So current ratios equal the current assets divided by current liabilities, and the quick ratio is the current assets minus the inventory divided by the current liabilities. The next one is the efficiency ratios, and these indicate a firm's ability to use assets to produce sales. Uh, they're also called turnover ratios, and in general, higher numbers are a favorable indicator. For day sales and inventory, however, a lower number is favorable. Uh, in order to find inventory turnover, you're just going to divide the cost of goods sold by the inventory. And then um, for a day sales and inventory, you just do a year over the inventory turnover, so 365 days. And the accounts receivables turnover would be the net sales over accounts receivable, and the day sales outstanding is the year over uh, accounts receivable turnover. So for asset turnover ratio, uh, the equation for total asset turnover is net sales divided by the total assets and fixed asset turnover is equal to the net sales over the net fixed asset. So for leverage ratios, leverage ratios indicate whether a firm is using the appropriate amount of debt financing. In general, higher ratios indicate greater potential return and greater bankruptcy risk. Total debt ratio is equal to the total debt over total assets. Debt to equity ratio is total debt over total equity. And equity multiplier is equal to the total assets over the total equity. Um, for coverage ratios, for bond ratios, a higher number generally indicates less bankruptcy risk and possible lower potential return. So for times interest um, earned, it's the Equity before income tax divided by interest expense and equity before interest tax. Divided by interest expense. The profitability ratios indicate whether a firm is generating adequate profit from, it, from its assets. In general, higher ratios indicate better performance. Uh, the main ones you need to know are the gross profit margin, which is the net sales minus the cost of goods sold, uh, divided by the net sales. You should also know the uh, 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 earnings before interest and taxes, uh, return on assets, which is the earnings before interest and taxes, divided by the total assets, and then uh, return on uh, assets, net income over total assets. Those are the most important. So market value indicators, market value ratios indicate how the market is valuing the firm's equity. Higher ratios indicate greater shareholder wealth. Um, the equation you need to know for this is the earning per share, which is net income divided by shares outstanding. Price earning ratio, which is the price per share over earnings per share. And the market to book ratio, which is market value of equity per share over book value of equity per share. Uh, we already know these, 
but the ROA is the net income divided by total assets and the ROE is the net income divided by stockholders' equity. Yeah. For selecting a, selecting a benchmark, um, a ratio or a ratio analysis is relevant when only when you're comparing to an appropriate benchmark. Um, The limitations of financial statement analysis, um, weaknesses of financial statement analysis, it's not an exact science, it relies on accounting data and historical costs, and a few guidelines and principles for determining whether the ratio is high or low, or a reason for confidence or concern. And this is the copyright. Thank you very much. Done with the chapters? Was there chapter six? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we did chapter six, discounted cash flows and valuation. I'll see you. I'll see you. For multiple cash, uh, for the future values of multiple cash flows, um, you need to draw a timeline to determine the number of periods uh, for which uh, for which each cash flow will earn the rate of return in that timeline. And it, then you calculate the future value of each cash flow using <coughs> equation 5.1, which is on the next slide, and add future values. Uh, this is the equation that you're going to use for that. And this is for two cash values, which is just two on the timeline, and then three cash values, which is going to be year three on the timeline, starting at zero. Um, once again, the present value of multiple cash flows. Um, for the present value, um, you just draw a same, same kind of timeline to show the magnitude and timing of each of the cash flows, and then calculate the present value of each individual cash flow, and then add the present values. Um, so you're basically going backwards um, from from the end of the year of the timeline, going uh, going back to the total present value uh, in this is an example of three cash values. So level of cash flow flows. Um, there's four different types: uh, annuity, uh, a series of which is a series of equally spaced and level cash flows extending over a finite number of periods. Perpetuity, perpetuity, a series of equally spaced and level cash flows that continue forever. The ordinary annuity, which is cash flows occurring at the end of the period. Um, and examples of this include mortgage payments and interest payments to bondholders. Annuity due is cash flows occurring, occurring at the beginning of a period. And examples of these are leases and car insurance. So present value of an annuity. Um, Present value of an annuity is the amount needed to produce it, um, the current fair value or market price of the annuity, and the amount of a loan that can be repaid with it. The equation is shown here. Uh, pre present value of the annuity equals cash flows over the interest rate times one minus one over 
uh, one plus interest uh, to the n power, which is the time. So this is an example um, which gives you uh, 2,000 as the uh, the ending value of, uh, uh, at the end of three years with a discount rate of 8%. Plug it in into the equation it's shown here to get an answer. Um, it's basically how borrowed funds are calculated over the life of the loan. And each payment includes less interest and more principal, and the loan is paid off with the last payment. And amortization schedule shows interest and principal in each payment, and the amount of principal still owed after each payment. And so here's a, a loan amortization table in detail. And so finding the interest rate. The present value of an annuity equation can be used to find the interest rate or discount rate for any for an annuity. Um, to determine the rate of return for an annuity, you solve the equation for I. And uh, using a calculator is, the, is easier, um, but you can also do it by trial and error. And so here's a calculator example using uh, 350,000 and uh, 50,000 for 10 years. And there's it in Excel. And so this is uh, the equation for the future value of an annuity. And then another calculator example for future value of an annuity. And then for perpetuities, uh, a stream of equal cash flows that goes on forever and preferred stock in some bonds are uh, perpetuities. And um, the equation for present value of a perpetuity can be derived from the present value of the annuity equation. And so here's just an example with the present value of a perpetuity um, equation at the bottom. And so an ordinary versus an ordinary annuity versus an annuity due. So the present value of an annuity due is the cash flows that are discounted for one period less than an ordinary annuity. And the future value of an annuity due is a cash flows earned compound interest for one period more than the ordinary annuity. And the present value or future value of an annuity due is always higher than that of an ordinary annuity that is otherwise identical. Uh, so here's an example of annuity due. Uh, you're just going to take the annuity due value, uh, and it's going to equal the ordinary annuity value uh, times 1 plus i. Thank uh, cash, you. Cash flows that grow at a constant rate uh, for annuity. Uh, growing annuity is an equally spaced cash flow that increases in size at a constant rate for a finite number of periods. Uh, and then below that is just an example of it. Uh, the formula will only work uh, when the growth rate is less than the discount rate. Um, so here's another example. Um, um, cash flows are growing at a constant rate, uh, perpetuity. Growing perpetuity, uh, it's an equally spaced cash flow that increases in size at a constant rate forever. Um, common stock whose dividends are expected to increase at a constant rate forever. So, uh, there's an equation for that. Um, here's another example of growing perpetuity. Uh, the effective annual interest rate. The uh, most common way to quote interest rates is in terms of annual percentage rate. Uh, APR. It does not incorporate the effects of compounding. Um, and the most appropriate way to quote interest rates is in terms of effective annual rate, which is EAR. Um, and that incorporates the effects of compounding. Uh, so APR. Uh, APR does not account for the number of compounding periods or adjust for the annualized interest rate for the time value of money. Uh, APR is not a precise measure of the rates involved in borrowing and investing. Uh, and here's an example of APR using 1% interest and when $2,000 was borrowed uh, for one week. Sure. Um, effective annual interest rate. Uh, EAR accounts for the number of compounding periods and adjusts for the annualized interest rate for the time value of money. Uh, and it's more accurate 
of the rates involved in lending and investing. Uh, and here's the first of two slides of the uh, EAR example. Uh, using 1% interest with $2,000 again for the first six. Um, the consumer protection information. Uh, the Truth in Lending Act of 1968 requires that borrowers be told of the actual cost of credit. Uh, the Truth in Savings Act of 1991 requires that the actual return on savings be close to customers. And the Credit Card Act of 2009 limits credit card fees and interest rate increases and requires better disclosure of contract details. Uh, yeah, and that's it. That's our presentation. I think it's like from the tag. Yeah. 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 Yeah.